So welcome back to our video series on the afterlife. This is part three, and today we're going to be talking about purgatory, whether or not there will be animals in heaven, and just in general what heaven's going to be like. As usual, though, we are going to start with a few rapid-fire questions because um, after the first two, heaven and hell, part one was heaven, part two was hell, there's, there's a lot of questions hanging over, and I think some of these are going to set a good stage for talking about what we need to today. And the first question is, why did you use Hitler as an example if he wasn't a Christian? In the last video on hell, I, I talked about um, Hitler as a, a prime example of why someone might not get into heaven. Uh, the answer to this one's actually pretty simple. Christ, um, Hitler was a Christian. Uh, Hitler professed to believe in Jesus, and yet everything he said and did during his life kind of contradicted that. So I think in a lot of ways, almost every way, Hitler's the perfect example of why saying that you believe in Jesus doesn't guarantee that you're really a Christian or really going to get into heaven. And that's why I think Hitler's a great jumping off point for talking about why some people end up in hell, even if they say that they're Christian, right? So I, I thought Hitler was actually a really good example because of that. Uh, number two, can Christians still choose to go to hell if they believe in Jesus? Uh, yes, and again, Hitler's a great example, but not just Hitler. I think there's a, a, I think there's a lot of types of Christians that are easy to imagine. People who say that they believe in Jesus, say that they are Christian, but then what they do don't reflect those beliefs. At which point you really have to question, are these people really Christians? If everything they say and do don't reflect what they say they believe, maybe it's not what they really believe, and furthermore, maybe they're not going to end up in heaven. Um, a lot of this, again, comes back to relationship between God and other people. If what I have done and how I think during my life severs my relationships with other people and with God, um, that basically is a rejection of God's love and subsequently heaven. Uh, I love this question. Will there be arguments in heaven? And I, <laughs> I almost answered it in the last video and I put it off until this one. So I love this question um, because there's, uh, it's easy to say, oh yeah, heaven's going to be perfect. There won't be any conflict. There won't be any arguments. But then if you say that, you're almost implying that people won't have opinions of their own or that everyone kind of becomes just sort of the weird clones of each other. And that doesn't sound good either. So here's what I did. I, I'm breaking arguments into basically three different categories. And I think if we talk about why do arguments happen in the first place, we will notice that some of these things are good or, or fine, and some of these things are bad. And obviously the bad stuff won't be around in heaven, but there may be kinds of arguments that still exist. For example, um, one kind of argument can be broken into... Uh, are, or classified as arguments over right and wrong. So in other words, atheists arguing with uh, Christians or Muslims or, or people who believe that there's a God. Obviously, one of these groups is right and one of these groups is wrong. And when we die, we're going to find out who was right, right? So, um, and a lot of arguments about morality or what the right thing to do is, arguments between right and wrong are naturally going to be solved because the moment you die, the moment that you're exposed to the beatific vision, all of these arguments are settled. There will no longer be arguments about whether God exists. There won't be arguments about, you know, <clears throat> um, just a, a lot of political arguments will fall apart. A lot of moral arguments will fall apart. So these things just sort of stop. Um, another, and this speaking of politics, another kind of argument is an argument over how to spend essentially how to spend resources. So probably the biggest place you'll see people argue is in the world of politics, right? And I'm about to horribly, horribly oversimplify politics. Politics is way more complicated than what I'm about to say. But I think what, how I break this apart is a good example of why arguments like these won't really happen. Um, people who tend to be on the left side of the political debate, so like liberals, uh, Democrats, uh, tend to really like to or try to provide people with services. Um, so you'll see a lot of, uh, liberals will be the people who come up with ideas like, um, you know, healthcare accessible for everybody, free healthcare for everybody, free school even, some people argue. No, no one is saying that those things are bad. Those are all good things. And the same is true on the other side. Um, conservatives, Republicans, uh, one of their main focuses is on lowering taxes so that people have more access to the money that they've earned. That's also a good thing. So neither of these groups is really arguing for something bad, objectively bad. They're arguing over how you should spend your resources. Because the fact of the matter is, free school and free health care is great, but someone has to pay for it, and it's going to end up meaning that everyone's taxes are raised. Um, so 
you know, do you let people keep their money or and not tell them how to spend it? Or do you take away um, their services? And there aren't really right or wrong answers to this. But these arguments are going to fall apart naturally when we get to heaven because, uh, well, there's no argument over resources. There will be plenty to go around for everyone. There's no shortage of resources in heaven, so you won't have arguments over how to spend your resources. The last classification for arguments that I wanted to touch on is the one that I think will probably still remain, which is just personal preferences. So things like arguing over what your favorite movie is. Some people might say Avengers Endgame is the greatest movie ever made. Some people say it's terrible, it's garbage, I'll, you know, you never watch it. Well, those arguments don't matter, and people can still have their opinions in heaven, and if people, when they get to heaven, keep arguing about little preferences like that, I think that's totally fine, as long as we're approaching each other with love and not being disrespectful and still allowing people to um, enjoy their own preferences. For instance, you know, if someone wants to get to heaven and just watch Avengers Endgame all the time with their friends, like, that's fine. <laughs> it doesn't bother me. Uh, so you can still argue and, I, you know, you can jokingly uh, argue with people about their, their, their um, you know, their movie preferences. I don't think those, those kinds of arguments necessarily have to go away. Um, but a lot of other arguments I think will, will just naturally kind of fall apart. Someone asked, if heaven is a physical place, then where is it? So in the first video, part one, I said heaven is actually a place, it's a real place. So if it is a real place, where is this place? Um, I think the best, this is extremely complicated, first of all, and uh, I'm going to try to give an answer, and my answer is, again, going to be kind of an oversimplification. But I want to start by pointing to Revelation chapter 21, verse 3, which says, Behold, God's dwelling is with the human race. He will dwell with them. And by the way, Revelation 21 is the same place we get a lot of this imagery um, of heaven. Probably the place in the Bible where the writer John is talking the most about heaven. Um, Behold, God's dwelling is with the human race. Notice the wording there. It doesn't say that, that we are going necessarily to God. This language actually seems to imply that God comes to us. So the proposal here, and of course we don't know what's going to happen, we don't know what the afterlife is, but this language of God will make God's dwelling here on earth, God will dwell with us and we will be his people, seems to imply that heaven is not so much us being pulled out of this world and sucked into another world somewhere. Heaven is about God coming to our plane of existence, coming to earth, and fixing everything that is broken. Um... There's a there's a show that I, I know not all of you have seen, so this is maybe not a great reference to use, but there's a show called Stranger Things. Uh, and in this show, in, the, in season one of Stranger Things, um, the mystery of the show revolves around this young boy who disappears. And there's this big search for where this boy has gone. And finally, when he and his mother are able to find a way to communicate, uh, they realize that he has been taken to basically another plane of existence that mirrors the world as we know it. So there's houses and trees and everything's still there, he's just in a different dimension, basically. Uh, the, the iconic scene from Stranger Things revolves around these uh, Christmas tree lights up on the wall and these letters that um, the boy and his mother used to spell out messages to each other. And when she asks, where are you, so that we can come uh, find you, the boy spells out the words, right here. Because he, he hasn't actually gone anywhere. He's physically present in his house. It's just in a different dimension. It's in a dimension that's a reflection of the, the earth where his friends and family are looking for him. Stranger Things is a really uh, odd show. Um, it's, it's very good. I recommend it. But I think that that simple premise kind of sets up the idea of what I think heaven's going to be like, not that it's people getting sucked into an alternate dimension, but that it's it's the idea that when God comes to earth, God creates an alternate dimension that is literally just the world we live in, but with everything fixed, with everything perfected, and now everything is good. Um, it's not that necessarily when we die, we go somewhere else, somewhere in outer space or up in the clouds. It's that heaven is right here, but it's a right here that has that is no longer broken. Um... Another question, did Satan, Satan create hell and what role does Satan play in hell? I got this question a lot. There's like five or six of you who asked uh, questions about Satan and how he fits into this whole story. Um, so Satan did not create hell, God created hell. But Satan did play a, an important role here because remember, hell, God didn't create hell as a way to punish people. 
God creates hell as an alternative, as an other place, so that people have a place to continue existing if they choose not to accept love and forgiveness. Satan, if we're trying to follow this really screwed up timeline, it appears that Satan's betrayal of God, when Satan said the non-servium, when Satan refused to follow God's plan, um, Satan would have been the first person to betray God and thus the first person who needed this other place to exist. So a lot of people have proposed, and of course we don't know if this is true, we don't know um, we don't know how the timeline works, and we won't know any of this for sure until we see the beatific vision, right? But um, it seems likely that uh, Satan, as the first person to betray God, would have been the first person to enter hell, and thus, when God created hell, God created it for Satan. Um, what role does Satan play in hell? Again, I haven't been to hell, so I don't know. Uh, it seems like... I don't, I don't know so much that it's Satan, like, torturing people there. I don't think Satan necessarily gets joy out of torturing people. He seems to appreciate status, so um, he maybe would like to perceive himself as the ruler of hell. I think he rejoices when people are sent to hell. Um, but once people are there, I don't know that it's so much about him wanting to torture people. If you recall in the unit when we talked about uh, angels and demons um, and Lucifer... Uh, Satan really doesn't like people that much. Um, I think, in general, Satan wouldn't really want to spend his time with the other people in hell. Leading back again to my original conclusion that I think hell is a lot of people just sitting in rooms by themselves binge-watching Netflix, I think Satan's doing the exact same thing. I think he's just, you know, he's he's watching re reruns of some History Channel show and he's just by himself. I don't think there's a whole lot of interaction in hell. In fact, one of the old, old Christian ideas about what hell is is that it's a place of loneliness even though there will be many people there these people aren't friends with each other they don't talk to each other it's a place where everyone closes themselves off and refuses to uh, communicate with each other uh, so I, I think satan is just part of that can people in hell decide to forgive others and accept jesus uh, again we don't know but i think so okay Theoretically, I'm going to say it's possible, but here's why it's extremely unlikely. Um, when you make a decision and then later on down the road turn back from that decision and do something else, the reason you change your mind is usually because you've learned new information, right? Um, like if you start dating someone and then the relationship ends and you break up, like you decide you don't want to see them anymore, it's not that you're flip-flopping or that you're going back on your original word. When you started dating them, you thought that you liked spending time with them. And then down the road, you go, oh, wait, maybe this person isn't right for me. So then you decide to break up. The difference between the decisions we make here on Earth and the decisions we make in the afterlife are that in the afterlife, we have all the information in front of us. We know exactly what's going to happen basically for all eternity, thanks to the beatific vision. When people decide to reject God's love and forgiveness, they know full well what they're doing. Think about Hitler. In order to, for, to, to get out of hell and rejoin heaven, he needs to be able to accept God's forgiveness and learn to love and embrace Jewish people. And he's never going to do that. Like, he spent his whole life, his whole identity is built around the idea of rejecting people of a certain race. He just, he can't. He won't. It's not going to happen. Um, so, theoretically, it's possible, but no, it's just, it's not going to happen. Okay, is heaven like one big area where you can see everyone in the world that has died, like in your own town, and you can only see certain people? It's an interesting question. I'm going to keep this one simple. I don't know. Um, what activities will humans be able to do in heaven? Are humans allowed to walk up to God slash Jesus and just have a normal conversation with him in heaven? I mean, uh, the, the theory I gave you in part one is that Jesus has a body. It's in heaven. We'll have a body in heaven. It seems like we'll be able to just communicate with each other just like normal. You'll be able to walk up and give Jesus a hug. I think that's really what we're talking about. Uh, remember, my whole premise here for the afterlife is that heaven is God coming into this world and fixing it. Uh, creating an alternate dimension of the world as we know it, but just with, you know, with all the broken stuff fixed. Now, I, I've used this expression a few times, with brokenness fixed. What do we mean when we say brokenness? 
uh, what are we talking about when we say that things are broken? I'm going to start by focusing on people. I think there's really three different ways a person can be broken. Uh, number one, you can be physically broken, meaning you know you're, there's something wrong with your body. You can't walk, you're in a wheelchair, maybe you got injured, uh, maybe you were in the military and a, a bomb goes off and you, know, you lose an arm or a leg or something. Uh, and if you're lucky enough to get through your whole life with no injuries, eventually you're going to get old, your body starts to break down. It's part of our natural existence that our bodies kind of end up falling apart. Uh, so that is a piece, that's an example of how we are, um, we eventually will become physically broken. Number two, we can be mentally broken. Uh, this can refer to people who are you know, just like uh, psychotic, who are mentally uh, mentally unstable, um, who are insane, we might say. I think there's a lot of people like serial killers, for instance, who just, it's not like their brains don't function normally. There's something actually wrong with them uh, mentally. Uh, then you have people who have clinical depression, who make a lot of decisions based on the fact that they are actually clinically depressed. Um, and then you just, of course, have just a, a whole range of mental disabilities. Um, Anything that is, the, the mind is not functioning the way the mind was intended to function. That is an example of how our world can be broken. And number three, you have spiritual brokenness. You have people who, uh, like Hitler, are racist or bigoted. You have people who reject God, like they believe in God, but they just reject God for, for because of something that happened in their life. And then, of course, you have wrong religions. And I'm putting wrong in air quotes because um, I don't want to come across as rude, but I think it's just sort of uh, kind of objectively obvious that if you have two different religions that, that reject each other's main premise, one of them is right and one of them is wrong. So for instance, I, I've already used this example, but you have atheists and you have Christians. Both of those religions can't be true, right? Like one of them fundamentally rejects the existence of God, one of them fundamentally uh, believes in the existence of God. They both can't be right. So at the end of time, there's going to be a whole lot of people who were quote-unquote wrong. Now it doesn't mean that what they were doing was bad, because there are many, many people who follow a variety of different religions that are all striving to be good people and follow the truth that's in their heart. That doesn't make them bad people, but it does mean that they have gotten some things wrong theologically. So, what do we do about this? Do these people just go to hell? Uh, we've, got, we've got a lot of stuff that needs to be fixed before any sort of heaven or entering of heaven can happen. And this is what led Christians early on to come up with an idea for what they called a cleansing process. Uh, logically, we decide that there must be some sort of process in between death and heaven where a person is cleansed of imperfection. Uh, so what do we mean and what does that look like? Well, let's do some examples. I'm going to start with one that I think makes the most sense, which is <laughs> Moana. Um, if, any of, if any of you have heard, there's an episode of my podcast called... Uh, oh, is Moana in Hell? I think was the I think was the name of the podcast. Um, but Moana is a great example because Moana is a fun. But Moana, by the way, I'm referring to the the Disney princess, the um, the the Pixar movie about the uh, the girl trying to return the heart of Defiti or whatever. Moana is um, belongs to a different religion. She follows the the religious um, the the culture and the religion of her people on Mot Motunui, I think was their island. Uh, yet, so she doesn't believe in Jesus. Um, she doesn't really believe in God the way that we would believe in God. Yet, she's a fundamentally good person. Um, she does what she does the best that she can. She does what is right. Uh, you know, she listens to her heart. Um, so, Moana doesn't believe in Jesus. Does this mean she goes to hell? I think we logically have to arrive at a conclusion that Moana probably isn't going to go to hell being a good person like she is. But she also has to accept Jesus before she can enter heaven. Because if she doesn't, it's going to be real weird for Moana, right? Like one minute she's alive, then she dies, and then boom, you know, she wakes up in heaven and Jesus is standing there. He's like, hi, I'm Jesus. And Moana's like, who? What is happening? Right? So I think part of maybe not quite the full extent of the beatific vision, but something similar to it happens at death where Moana learns the truth of the universe and God and Jesus and everything and it ha is exposed to it and then has a moment where she can choose to accept or reject it because it's not Moana's fault that she never heard about Jesus or heard about any of this uh, deeper theology it's not her fault like she grew up you know out sailing on a boat with Maui and that chicken whatever his name was so um so it's not her fault, so at death I think she will be, I think logically we have to assume she will be exposed to this information and will have a chance to choose. 
Uh, second example, mentally disturbed people. Uh, there are people who e uh, commit crimes, even violent crimes, they'll even murder other people, but it seems to be not so much a result of them hating other people, uh, it's not like they're going out and committing crimes against these people because they don't like them or, or you know, hate them or don't love them. It's that they're they're sick. They are mentally disturbed. They're they're committing these crimes because um, something is wrong with with their mind. Something is broken in their mind. Um, again, it's hard to. I'm not saying what what they're doing is okay, but it's hard to say that these people are condemned to hell because of their actions when they really don't have full control over what they're doing. Same could be said for um, you know people who just you know have clinical depression and make choices that hurt themselves or hurt other people uh it's not totally them making that choice you have a whole lot of other influences on that choice that aren't just them in their head and their head isn't quite working correctly and then the last one is you have of course your physical um physical disabilities those are a little bit easier to wrap your head around because i think we all kind of agree if you're in a wheelchair during your life you probably won't be in a wheelchair in the afterlife unless maybe you feel like your wheelchair is part of your identity maybe god will let you keep it anyway one way or another um the term for this cleansing process that christians came up with early on was using the word purgare which meant purifying and over time it turned into the word purgatory now the reason i don't like bringing up the word purgatory is because it, is, it has taken on a vastly different meaning from what it was originally supposed to when people hear the word purgatory they hear an idea for this place where people get stuck like it's halfway between heaven and hell and you go there and you get stuck and you, you can't get to either and then you, you have to wait there a really long time, maybe forever, and then eventually you get into heaven and it, it's sort of like a waiting room for heaven or, or a place where you go if you're uh, like kind of bad but not totally bad. None of these things are true, um, at least as far as we know. Uh, the, actual, the actual doctrine of purgatory, as is believed in by many Christians, including Catholics, is that it is simply a process, please note the word, process, not a place, it's not a waiting room, it is a process by which the person is cleansed of their imperfection before they enter heaven. So it's like you die, you are exposed to the truth of the universe, the things about you that were broken are fixed, then you get to enter heaven. It's a process, it's not a waiting room, it's not a place, and it's certainly not one of these weird pits of fire. That I literally, if you Google the word purgatory, this is one of the pictures that come up. It's just like, what? Like It looks like hell, almost. It's people dancing around in the fire, and it's all, I don't know. Why, and why are they all white people with the exact same haircut? That's, are we supposed to read into that? I don't I'm moving on. Uh, there's another term. Uh, that you should be aware of. This is not something we believe in as Christians anymore, but Christians used to believe in this, so I just want to talk about it. And that's the term limbo. Purgatory and limbo are not the same thing. Limbo is its own, its own deal. Uh, this came up in the Middle Ages. People in the Middle Ages had this question of what happens to people who are sort of good, but sort of bad, or like they're good people, but they don't believe in God. Or maybe it's like a baby dies, but the baby never had a chance to accept Jesus. Does the baby go to hell? In the Middle Ages, they came up with this term called limbo, which is where babies and people who don't believe in Jesus kind of just float around for all eternity, but they don't go to hell either, and they're just stuck there. Christians today don't believe in this anymore. Limbo is not a thing anymore. Christians today believe in what is called purgatory. Purgatory is not the same thing. Purgatory is simply a process by which you're cleansed before you enter heaven. So get it right, the History Channel. Uh, yeah, limbo is wrong. Limbo doesn't exist. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, uh, now we've arrived finally at the most asked question of the year. Will there be pets in heaven? And here we go. Start with the idea of the soul. I've heard a lot of people say, oh, animals can't be in heaven because they don't have souls. Um, first of all, that's not really true. The original concept of the soul or the animus uh, was believed to be the animating principle of all living things. That means animals... Um, people, even plants, supposedly had an animus. So animals do have souls. The question is, do they have immortal souls, or will the, their souls live on for eternity? Uh, the way that people do. Uh, so here's number one. Number one, animals cannot experience the beatific vision the way that people can. Um, they don't, they wouldn't understand it, they don't have a high enough intellect, and even if you showed a dog the beatific vision, the dog wouldn't care. It just wants, you know, bacon if you're if we are to believe the commercials uh and that's the other thing animals don't care who god is 
uh, you could explain to your cat or dog all about Jesus and they just wouldn't care. They'd be like, who, who is that person? Are they going to give me treats? Okay, then forget about it. Um, all of these are, are the strongest reasons people use to say, well, animals won't be in heaven. However, there's a little bit more here. Because Genesis 1 and Revelation 21 tell us a little bit something about animals in the afterlife. Namely, that there will be a new heavens and a new earth. Again, coming back to this idea that heaven is not some other place, it's right here, just fixed. Uh, basically, we have this book ending of the story of the Bible where in Genesis you see creation. Uh, it's the first book of the Bible, Genesis is creation. And then the last book of the Bible, which is Revelation, is a story of recreation or how the world will eventually go through a new um, process of being cleansed, a kind of, I guess, purgative or purgatory process where the whole world is cleansed and fixed and then that becomes the new heavens and the new earth that we eventually spend eternity in. We also hear, and this line I've actually found in several different theology textbooks, the, this presumption that all of creation will eventually be reunited with its creator. And notice it says here, all creation. It doesn't just say all people, all of creation will eventually be reunited with the creator. So theoretically, we're not just talking about animals here. We're talking about rocks, trees, everything that makes up our physical world was part of the original creation story in Genesis 1. And it seems to be an integral part of what God envisioned in this existence forever after. Um, God didn't envision heaven to be just clouds and uh, people floating around. It's like souls, disembodied souls floating around. God from the beginning, from Genesis, envisioned heaven as a kind of new earth where, where it was basically it's the Garden of Eden. It's the Garden of Eden, but reestablished where everyone and all of the plants and animals can live, but now actually be happy. Okay, again, we're running short on time today, so we're going to stop this video here. Unfortunately, there's a couple of questions left we didn't have time to answer. I'm going to overflow those into our next class uh, just as a wrap-up and make sure that we get all of these last-minute questions. But that's all for our video for today. Um, I will see you in the next one.